Well, thank you very much for the kind welcome, uh, Professor Shu. It's a, a, a pleasure to follow uh, my role model and idol, Professor Swaminathan. Um, it's, uh, um, uh, it's such a rich experience, uh, uh, Dr. Swaminathan, what you bring to the sustainability, poverty, and nutrition problems. Uh, that's unrivaled, and I think we are always very happy to see you here. You served as in the first board of my institute, the Center for Development Research, and um, um, gave it the right direction early on. So thank you for that. Uh, colleagues um, and uh, friends, uh, actually I appreciate the terminology of uh, biohappiness. Um, but I think we need a little bit of bioeconomy so that we don't have biosadness. Uh, and I will explain why. Uh, my focus will be on, inno on, I on innovation issues. Um, and I come a bit from an economic perspective today. Uh, that's how it works. Before I start, let me remind you what are the roots of innovation. The scarcity of factors, yeah, Not macht erfinderisch, the scarcity of factors. Creativity and experimenting, we had these wonderful examples and driving home this point so strongly by Professor Swaminathan. And public policy, education, spending on research, on institutions like yours. And we need to distinguish between two types of innovations, institutional, and technological innovation. I will make essentially four points in my talk. First, I will talk a bit ab about green economy and what role does bioeconomy play in that. Then I will run you through the current problems and emerging problems of the world food and nutrition equations. Then on technical and institutional innovations for ending hunger and undernutrition and very briefly on public policy. And I will end with a call for a redesign of our international science system related to agriculture, food, and nutrition. I see bioeconomy at the heart of, uh, of uh, the green economy. It's a centerpiece of the green economy. The green economy which is interested to um, be more efficient, to reduce waste to zero, to come to low ecological footprints, to sustainable production processes, zero carbon emissions. Bioeconomy is, is at the heart of that. We in the uh, Bioökonomie Rat, in the Bioeconomy Council in Germany, define bioeconomy, and I purposely wrote here how we see it in German. It's bio-basierte Wirtschaft, it's bio-based economy, um, which I think gives it a slightly different uh, touch than bioeconomy in the translation, and bioeconomy and bio-based economy. I prefer bio-based economy, sustainable bio-based economy. That's knowledge-based production and utilization of biological resources for products, production processes, where lots of biochemistry comes in, and services in the economic system. Bioeconomy means linking value chains. That's all what I want to say to this complex figure. Linking value chains, coming from value chains to value webs. Big challenge for optimizing value webs rather than a value chain from soil to, uh, to people's health and happiness. There are four drivers of the bioeconomy. Prices, which change, and thereby change the demand for bioeconomy products. Climate change and energy policy, different re and new regulations. The innovation opportunities and changed preferences of people. And I will later say, uh, with a based on a document, that 
we have a simultaneous change on all these four fronts, and that's why we currently have an explosion of bioeconomy action around the world, not just in Germany. Before I do that, let me come to the problems of the food and nutrition equations. The word food equation is a very simple idea. Yeah, you have global supply and global demand, and uh, supply, by definition, has to be uh, equated. And when this is at a high level, we have low prices, and when the equation is at a low level, we have high prices and volatile prices. That's what we currently have. On the supply side, uh, you can glance at the key uh, drivers there. Um, of course, technology plays a key role. On the demand side, bioenergy, biomass, the basic resources of the bioeconomy play a key role. Within the supply side and within the demand side, we have lots of shifts and new competitions, and we have also new situations within the framework of markets, prices, speculation, international trade, supermarketization. So the pattern and the level of the world food equation has come um, under change and under stress. Professor Swaminathan has already mentioned the major problems which we need to distinguish when we talk about food and nutrition security. The hunger issue, the micronutrient hidden hunger issue, the children's undernutrition, the essential first thousand days, and the obesity issues. We talk large numbers um, on that. The most recent estimate has been reaffirmed in the peer-reviewed document of The Lancet uh, three weeks ago that uh, um, more than three million deaths of children under five, which is uh, about 40%, uh, of uh, deaths relate to nutrition problems. No change on, in that pattern of infant and child mortality. Each of the nutrition problems I've just been listing and we have been talking about have a different T, a different time subscript, and that we need to keep in mind. We need to have a very um, diverse research and action agenda which addresses the long-term, the medium-term, and the short-term nutrition and food security issues with institutional and with technological innovations. That's often forgotten. If we only address the long-term um, and not take care of the short-term uh, volatility issues and shock issues, um, the long-term implications of not taking care of the short-term are very serious for people. There is big progress on the, in the world nutrition and hunger situation in terms of relative progress. So the decline in the last 20 years from about 19% to 13% of the world population being caloric deficient. That's only one aspect, the crude hunger. The decline of child underweightedness from 40 to 26% in that period. It is progress, big progress. The ending of hunger and of child undernutrition by 2030, in my opinion, is now a realistic goal. Well, it will not come automatically if we follow the trend. The trend has to be accelerated, the downward trend has to be accelerated uh, by about 50% in order to come to, um, to a, an end hunger and undernutrition situation in 2030. Land, global land, is not much available anymore. The land use of cropland curve is flat. And at the same time, uh, as uh, about 40% of the world's poor live on degraded areas, degradation is still progressing. And again, at the same time, we have a new rush into land, land acquisitions, including but not only land grabbing, land has become an international market. And as uh, lots of small holdings are uh, affected by that, um, it's a serious issue. The property rights issues around land and access to water have become very serious issues in many countries. 
The structural change in the world food equation will give us these orange prices if we trust best model estimates from the International uh, Food Policy Research Institute. Say the wheat price uh, going up by 40 to 30 to 40 percent uh, from the yellow to, to the orange. The red columns give you the add-on uh, due to expected climate change effect. So climate change will add to the shortages uh, in, the, uh, in the future. Um, and this is modeled under um, reasonably optimistic scenarios of technological change. Price volatility has increased. And what's new if we compare the last century, um, the red curve is banking crisis, uh, the greenish curve is world wheat prices, uh, financial crashes and agriculture commodity prices had no relationship until the early 1990s. Thereafter, they have become closely related. Financialization has set in and uh, will not go away. It's an asset class. So a whole set of prices drives the food prices today. And um, uh, innovation matters for on, on whole fronts, not just innovation in agriculture, matters on the whole front of issues in order to, um, to keep uh, food prices from uh, inflating too much. Let me come to technical and institutional innovation aspects. Um, the what and how of innovations for food security needs to be distinguished. I will talk less on the what and more on the how. We had these wonderful uh, examples of uh, innovation from science and innovation from farmers, uh, top-down, bottom-up, coming together. We need both. There's absolutely no doubt about that. We need your type of institutions and we need the nurturing of farm-based innovation and strong incentives for both. But how? How to make these incentives work? We need innovation system strengthening, incentives for the results and finance, and we need to rethink line, uh, the whole landscape of science. Look only here at the left-hand side of how world agricultural production evolved last decade and is expected to evolve next decade. Uh, it was about 2% and best estimates of OECD and FAO who do these every year, these are the most recent one from uh, a couple of weeks ago, suggest uh, it will only, agri world agriculture will grow only by 1.5%. That's pretty close to population growth, it's 1.1, 1.2 and uh, income growth is added. So if this is true, if this turns out to be true, we have a continued problem of uh, world food equation balancing at a low level, resulting in lots of disturbances and, uh, and uh, um, volatilities. Um, what is uh, currently feeding the world is innovation. Um, of course, it's farmers, but uh, it's innovation. That part of the column here, this dark one, uh, we call total factor productivity. So the innovations, uh, on top of using uh, cropland, uh, irrigation, uh, input intensification, so more fertilizer or so. And you see the top of this um, uh, set of components which build up the total rate of uh, production growth has been growing a lot. At the time of Green Revolution, this was rather small. Yeah, up there. This is total world, total factor productivity. Then we had lots of input intensification, yeah? uh, fertilizer, pesticides, uh, uh, irrigation, and so on. That has not, that's no longer today's world. The world actually is on a good track if we go by this graph. Um, we are uh, producing more with less, with more creativity, with more innovation but still not enough um, uh, that, uh, to, to keep that part of the, of the growth rate growing requires 
investment and incentives, technological innovations. As we had these wonderful examples from Professor Swaminathan, I don't guide you through this one. But uh, let me highlight some of the institutional innovations which we need. The framework conditions for innovations need to improve. Um, appropriate, not too strict, but clear IP protection, the access to genetic resources across borders, uh, sharing. We need innovative incentive systems combining the enhanced funding of basic research with results-oriented awards, including innovation prices. Um, there's good new social science research on the power of innovation prices, where you say, produce this innovation and you win the price of uh, a million or ten. And then, uh, uh, actually, the silver and bronze medal winner also needs to get an award, otherwise too few people uh, scramble for it. And uh, you get boosts of innovation. We currently have such experiments going with, on with farmers in northern Ghana. Yeah? Um, uh, nominate your best innovation, which you have actually implemented in the field, and you win a motorbike. We got beautiful innovations no one had heard of, of the nature Professor Swaminathan has uh, mentioned also from India. So innovation prizes. Let's experiment more with institutional innovations of that nature. But technological and institutional innovations are linked. They are not separate. Technology we need in order to boost output and change quality of products, micronutrient uh, deficiency uh, contents of the, of the crops. Institutional innovations we need to address the other side of food and nutrition insecurity. So the access, the utilization um, aspects, uh, and the stability issue uh, of the world food equation. So uh, all the ways to stock holding policy for grains and so on. In sum, uh, producing more with less requires uh, sustainable intensification, and not only on the production side. Um, intensification process, sustainability measures, we need to be clear that we are not just after production outputs but also after income and after nutrition improvements. The outcomes of sustainable intensification have to reach all the way to people's well-being. Let me conclude with a set of policy actions. The overview is this. The world food equation is in a risky situation. We need risk prevention, risk management, social protection and insurance systems. All four. Risk prevention comes largely through productivity enhancement. Risk management is policies and socioeconomic actions, stockholding, more trade openness, and so on. Social protection is also um, socioeconomic innovation, safety nets, cash transfers, and so on. And insurance systems can be public and private, and I think that's where we will get a lot of new um, uh, new system designs um, as ICT is strengthened and as uh, 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 crop and people insurances uh, will become cheaper per unit. Uh, I think this will be the, be the next big rural institutional change. We need a new science policy. If you look at um, uh, what the world currently spends on agriculture science, you see that uh, China is on the top about uh, six billion per annum. Uh, Germany used to be number three, we are number six, uh, about a billion um, uh, dollars. Not bad. Um, actually, the knowledge stock versus the annual expenditure uh, gives a slightly different picture. I think in terms of knowledge stock, we are still number four. But uh, I don't care about this competition too much. These countries need to work more closely together in order to produce more with the same. And they need to work more closely with the private sector in order, which spends another 50 to 75 percent more. Uh, so the total sum of what the world spends uh, is about uh, uh, public uh, uh, 
expenditure is about 35 billion um, uh, and about uh, 55 including uh, the private sector. That's a lot of money, but I think it's not well spent, uh, not focused enough spent. I have said something has changed around the bioeconomy, which is new research initiatives. That's what country after country in the last three years suddenly have invented bioeconomy research programs and strategies. Here's the list. Germany right in the middle there. Yeah? Nationale Forschungsstrategie Bioökonomie. German government currently works on a policy strategy uh, uh, to follow the research strategy. Um, lots of others have done the same. It proves my point. I believe that um, something has changed in the framework conditions around uh, the world on resource prices, uh, technological opportunities and people's preferences, driving um, everyone from uh, from Kreml to White House to, uh, to Berlin uh, into, a, I think, a healthy trend towards a bio-based bio economy. Um, the German Bioeconomy Council suggests these five points of substantive priorities, bioeconomic competitiveness policies and research for that, fostering technology and institutional innovations. I gave you a few examples. Natural resource production and protection strategies, consumer benefits and health. That's where the happiness side has to come in. Environment and nature. Um, I point to our strategy paper quoted here, which is on the website of the Bioeconomy Council. Let me conclude with this slide. The World Food Equation is in a precarious situation. <coughs> We have the world spends on innovation at a healthy level, but not integrated enough. Policy action follows on a number of frontiers after the world food crisis of 2008. Action has come about um, in, uh, at the level of the United Nations and the G8, G20. So it, is not, it would be unfair to say um, we had a crisis, nothing has happened. Not true. Uh, I don't want to spend the time now to belabor that point uh, further. But I think we need one additional s step of action. Um, we need a global body tasked with the challenges of agricultural development and food and nutrition security science, mapped roughly after the International Panel on Climate Change which brings together the whole body of world science for permanent assessments, not a study here, a study there, a permanent assessment, um, um, uh, forced into a dialogue, conflict-ridden dialogue with policymakers. And um, uh, this independent global research platform um, would then facilitate evidence-based advice at a global scale. The world science community around agriculture, food, and nutrition security, I underline not just agriculture, uh, doesn't have such a body currently and doesn't have an incentive to, um, to drive the science agenda forward. So this is my daring proposal. Um, the problems, I make that because the problems will not go away. We have probably the most challenging uh, two to three decades before us until the middle of the century when um, the uh, about nine billion, I don't think it will be ten, uh, curve will level off. But uh, to get there in a sustainable way requires a new way for us uh, uh, in the science system. Uh, where we also have to do um, more with less. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>